Um, this is a large project to collectively analyze 2,800 tumor normal uh, whole genome sequence pairs. And I'll, in particular, I'll talk about the mutation calling aspect um, that I've primarily been involved in. And uh, after that, I'll talk a little bit about nanopore sequencing, upcoming sequencing technologies, uh, some of the algorithms my group has been developing for that uh, sequencing platform and, and the applications towards cancer genomics that we're, uh, we're hoping to, to use. Um, so I'll start with PCOG. Um, so PCOG is a very large international consortium. Um, it has about 16 working groups organized around some theme of analysis of, of, of cancer genomes. Those working groups have collectively 130 different research projects um, with, with 700 researchers involved from, from literally all around the world. Um, so this, this is a large collection of, can, uh, of whole genome sequence cancers. So there's already been, been pan-cancer projects focused on exome sequencing to look at um, what, what exome sequencing tells us about uh, coding mutations. And the, the, the goal of PCOG is really to expand this pan-cancer analysis, looking across different tumor types at uh, the non-coding genome and, and what whole genome sequencing tells us. So there's working groups involved in looking at uh, regulatory regions, non-coding RNAs, um, large-scale genomic structural changes, mutation signatures, evolution heterogeneity, and really any, anything that you could think of doing for, uh, for a, a, a cancer genome data set is, uh, is covered by one of the work and groups, and I imagine we'll hear some results from the PGOG project during this week. Um, so to collectively analyze and, and, and do uniform data processing of these 2,800 genomes, we need quite a lot of compute. Um, the, the data set weighs in at about 500 terabytes, and no single center was volunteering to do uh, all of the analysis for the PCOG data set. So there's been um, uh, a set of cloud computing centers who have been, um, ha have been recruited to help process this data in, in a distributed manner. And these are spread all around the world and cover both uh, academic computing clouds like, say, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and uh, the EBI's London, London uh, Data Center, and also commercial vendors like Amazon uh, Web Services in both Ireland and Oregon are uh, contributing compute and helping to host the data. Um, this, all, all told, encompasses about 16,000 cores of, of computation power and about 60 terabytes of RAM in aggregate. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, we'll probably hear other talks about some of the downstream results of, of what people have found from the, this PCOG data set. So I'm going to focus on the process of finding somatic mutations from this set of, of 2,800 genomes. Um, so when the pan-cancer project was starting, they asked for abstracts from research groups who wanted to do some sort of computation on this data set. And there was a lot of interest of running various mutation calling algorithms on, uh, on the data set. Now, despite the, this very large compute cloud that's been arranged, um, we couldn't run all of the mutation calling pipelines on all 2,800 genomes. So what the pan-cancer steering committee decided is that there'd be a set of uh, three core pipelines that would be run on everything. That's the, the Broad Institute's mutation calling pipeline, the Sanger and DKFZ pipelines. And then the remaining callers, of which there's about a dozen, would be run on a 50 sample subset of the 2,800 genomes. Um, uh, and from that 50 uh, sample subset, we would do extensive validation of the mutations uh, with the goal of comparing the, the performance of the different mutation calling pipelines and, and coming up with an idea of how to construct a consensus call set that merges the calls from the three core pipelines into one um, with better properties than, than any individual caller. So to do the validation, um, we did deep seat resequencing on Illumina. So we, we designed a Nimblegen capture array um, for about 130,000 uh, mutation sites. And then we resequenced them in, in the tumor sample and the normal sample. And every one of these points here is uh, a validated SNV call. And the benefit of doing extremely deep resequencing on Illumina is that we'd end up with about 1,000x on average per site. And we can do a fairly simple classification between the calls that validate to be true and the calls that validate to be false. So this cluster of points here are calls where there is much stronger evidence in the tumor sample than the normal. And uh, this line here where the VAFs and the tumor normal are correlated are things where there's not enough evidence, much more evidence in the tumor to say that it's not a germline mutation. Um, 
So once, once we have our validation classifications, we can then start to calculate precision and recall per uh, mutation calling pipeline. So each point here is just a mutation calling pipeline with precision on the y-axis, recall or sensitivity on the x-axis. And this is for, for substitution or single nucleotide variant calls. Um, we see that the major distinguishing factor between the mutation call pipelines is for, for SNVs is the sensitivity of the caller. Most callers have very good precision. They're not making uh, very many false calls, but they vary widely in their, in their ability to find uh, the true mutations. Uh, from, the, from the lowest sensitivity caller having less than 10% sensitivity all the way up to the mutex pipeline, which is a very well-tested uh, substitution caller having about 98% uh, sensitivity. Um, now, if we look at insertion and deletion mutations, we see uh, a much worse performance, and this probably doesn't come as a surprise to many of you, in that uh, the, the, the performance of finding insertion and deletion mutations is really all over the place. Um, we find that some callers are able to have uh, fairly high precision for finding insertion and deletions, but none of them have a very good sensitivity, with the best topping out at about 55 to 60 percent sensitivity. Um, this plot includes all insertion and deletion mutations that, that we tried to validate, including homopolymer runs, which are probably the most difficult class of, of in indel mutations to find. If we restrict ourselves to not including indels and, and uh, STRs, we see somewhat better mutation calling performance with some pipelines having sensitivity over 60, 65 percent, but the, none of them doing a, uh, a great job, unlike for substitutions. And if we look at structural variation, again, we see a very similar picture. Some pipelines having uh, fairly decent precision, but none of them having extremely good sensitivity that would push them up into the, the top right of this plot where we'd like to see the callers. Um, so what I take away from this is that, that despite all of the, the, the work on calling indels and structural variation, we're still in quite a difficult position where there's not one dominant approach that uh, we can run and, and get a comprehensive set of variant calls for on a cancer genome. Um, I think SNV calling is largely a solved problem. Um, there's some work maybe to be done with uh, low frequency mutations, but in general, SNV calling is, is in a much better state than calling uh, larger mutations. So I've been, I was working particularly on indel calling using assembly-based approaches for the last few years, and I've started to think now about how long reads, like reads that are 10,000 base pairs in length rather than 100 base pairs in length, are going to improve the situation uh, for finding these more complex rearrangements. And the rest of my talk will be about um, how we've been using nanopore data and anal building methods to analyze nanopore sequencing data. Uh, I'm not alone in this idea that long reads are going to help, and in a way it's very obvious, um, but I'd just like to point out that Mike Schatz's group has done a very nice job of looking at how PAC bio data, which also gives you reads on the scale of 10,000 bases, will help um, find structure variation, and they've sequenced a uh, breast cancer cell line to, to very high depth, um, and, and I'll just, this, there's a link to his slides here that, that uh, covers that project. <coughs> So there are four main reasons I'm interested in nanopore sequencing. Um, the first is that the, the sequencer is extremely portable. Um, if you haven't seen one, the, the min-ion sequencer is roughly the size of this clicker. Um, you plug it into a laptop with a, a USB cable, and then you just load a sample into the top of it, and it sequences um, directly on your bench top. That opens up a lot of new applications of sequencing, particularly in uh, resource-limited conditions or uh, in, in, in clinical sequencing labs where they might not have the infrastructure to support, say, an Illumina sequencer. Like PacBio, the Nanopore instrument gives you extremely long reads. You can sequence 10,000 base pair reads or even 50,000 base pair reads as long as you're careful enough with a library prep. And the, the technology is also scalable. The, the version of the sequencer is very small. It, it has about 500 nanopores, which sequence in parallel. Uh, the larger version of the instrument that's currently uh, in, in prototyping has about 140,000 pores. At that level of, of, of um, parallelization, they should be able to sequence uh, human genomes and cancer genomes using uh, nanopore technology. And the final thing, and the thing I'm most excited about, is that uh, nanopore sequencing can directly detect base modifications like methylcytosine without an additional assay like uh, bisulfite sequencing. And I'll give some results in, in just a few minutes here after I talk about what nanopore data looks like. 
Um, so here's a very nice illustration that uh, David Eccles made of, of what the setup of a nanopore sequencer looks like. So here we have a membrane with the nanopore embedded in the membrane. Um, and the DNA passes through single-stranded through the pore in this direction. And as it passes through, it's blocking the flow of current of a, of a conducting fluid from this side of the membrane uh, through here. And about 3,000 times a second, about 3 kilohertz, the, the amount of current that's flowing through the pore is sampled uh, by a pico ammeter. And this current uh, measurement is the output of the sequencer. So unlike, say, Illumina technology, which is based on fluorescence and step-by-step -step sequencing um, of, of DNA, you're just getting this continuous measurement of the amount of current that's being blocked by the pore, which is indicative of the sequence that's, that's in there. Um, and the most important thing is that we're not reading single bases here. Um, there, the length of this channel is, is, is roughly, say, five to six bases, and the amount of current that's blocked is dependent on that entire five to six base pair sequence rather than just single bases. And that's the primary challenge of analyzing nanopore data. Um, so again, here's what it looks like in a, in, in a different form. We have our nanopore here. There's some sequence in it. And there, uh, as the current's being measured, it's uh, read out like this in, in, in samples over time. So here we have about, uh, say, the current measurement is about 60 picoamps. Once a new sequence uh, moves through the pore, the current signal might change, and then change again, change again, change again. As the, the sequence goes through there, we see these jumps in current depending on uh, what the sequence is. Now, we don't work with the raw samples uh, from the nanopore sequencer. On board uh, the hardware, there's a, an algorithm that segments the current into what's called events. And an event is just uh, a long uh, a, a group of the individual samples that where the, the, the segmentation algorithm has thought that it hasn't changed over that time. And the output of the sequencer is therefore um, a table in an HDF5 file where we have a group of events, uh, with each one having its mean current estimated, the standard deviation, and the time or the duration of those individual events. And that's the, the data that we actually are able to work on. Pavel? Do you assume that translocation happens to this roughly the same speed? Um, right now, uh, in, in, uh, in my very la last slide, I'm going to talk about the open problems. And, and one of the open problems is modeling the duration of, of each event to recover things like homopolymer runs. Um, the, the enzyme performance tends to stutter. So sometimes you'll have a very long event um, that it, it should be roughly exponential, but sometimes you get much longer events than expected, which is one of the challenges of, of, of trying to say, how long, uh, how long the, the, the sequence was that moved through for each event. Um, so right now, I don't think anybody is actually modeling the events, and, and we don't uh, assume that, it's, that it, it's, it's roughly uniform or independent of the sequence. Um, maybe I'll leave it there and then, and then come back to this question a little bit. Um, so the, primary, the, the first thing you might do with nanopore data is you want a base call. So you want to take these events and... Um, predict which sequence generated this, this group of, of current samples. And to do that, Oxford Nanopore provides a, a map from sequence for all possible five MERS to what the, the, the measured event should be. And this is just a set of Gaussian distributions. For example, when the sequence AAAC is in the pore, uh, we expect to see events with mean current level 54.2 picoamps, standard deviation 0.9. Um, and if you take that and you build, say, a hidden Markov model, you can then uh, take your event table and then predict uh, which sequence each one of these events uh, corresponded to. Now, this is an inherently very lossy um, uh, method in that by going from, from, from events to sequences, if you just work with the sequence data, which has about a 15% error rate, um, you're, you're not able to recover all of the information that was in these raw samples. Um, and so we try to work with the raw uh, event data as much as possible. 
So I mentioned a few slides ago that the nanopore sequencer is very portable. Um, as a test of the portability of the nanopore sequencer, uh, my colleagues Nick Lohman and, and Josh Quick, they took uh, the min-ion and all the associated equipment that you need to, to, to make uh, min-ion libraries. They packed it up into about three suitcases and took it to Guinea in West Africa uh, to perform real-time surveillance of the Ebola outbreak. Um, this is, this is the, the sequencing setup that they had there in, in, in one of the, the field clinics. And these are the three main ions that they used uh, to sequence. They were able to do about 140 Ebola samples um, based on amplicons over a period of a few months. Uh, and as I said, directly in, in, in the field hospitals in Guinea. Um, so my contribution to this project was uh, developing a way of calling SNPs from the nanopore data by using the signal data. Um, and as the current levels are dependent on multiple bases, the, these KMERS, uh, we can't treat each SNP indiv individually. So we can't just say, OK, let's look at all possible one base mutations of the Ebola genome and then test each SNP. We have to cluster them together into groups. Um, and the way that we do that is by generating what we call candidate haplotypes. So say we have a position of the Ebola genome that has uh, we think might have two SNPs, either a C in this position or a T here, we would generate four possible haplotypes, one with no SNPs, one with just the C, one with just the T, and um, one with both the C and the T. We would then uh, test them, calculate the likelihood of each haplotype using the signal data, and then pick the, 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 the haplotype with the maximum likelihood as our output uh, for this region. In this example, it's just the G to T mutation here. Um, now, the, the, the most important thing is this function here. What does this function P, D, given S looks, look like? Um, so we've built a hidden Markov model uh, for computing this. And our hidden Markov model uh, is, is designed to account for three different types of errors. Um, the first type is where the signal is over-segmented, so where one group of sample is broken up into many different parts rather than just being um, a segment for, for a single camer. And then the opposite type of error, where the, the signal is under-segmented, where what should be uh, multiple camers was merged into one long segment, and also where um, the nanopore sequencer just missed um, a, 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 a sequence that moved through too quickly to register enough samples to detect as, as, a, as a, a unique event. Um, so our, our HMM has three states then. We have these M states that we call, which match events to camers. E states, if we've observed extra events for a particular camer, um, and K states if we didn't ever observe any events for a particular camer to handle uh, over segmentation in the E states, under segmentation and short um, events in the K states. Then we just have the, 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 the normal, use the forward algorithm to compute this function, um, where this term is the emission distributions that came from this table mapping camers to Gaussian distributions. And these are transition probabilities that depend on how likely it is that you're going to miss a transition determined by how similar the, the Gaussian distributions are uh, for adjacent camers in your sequence. Okay, so that's the basic HMM that we use. I'm now going to talk about methylation. So the idea of, uh, of methylation detection using the nanopore sequencer is that because you're, you're, you're sensing the actual uh, perturbation of the current from the DNA molecule, any sort of chemical modifications of that DNA molecule might affect the, the, the current in a different way. Um, this was shown a few years ago in, in experimental nanopore sequencers by uh, Mark Akison's group at UCSC. And uh, I've been working with uh, Winston Timp at Johns Hopkins University of validating this and building predictive models uh, from, the, from Oxford Nanopore's min-ion instrument. Um, so what Winston Timp did is he took uh, a set of E. coli DNA, he uh, synthetically methylated it with a CPG methyl transferase to build a training data set that we could use uh, to relearn these emission distributions for variants of the KMERS that contained methylation or not. Um, so here's what uh, the trained distributions look like for a few different examples. So this is in, in the context of ATGACG, where this C can either be methylated or not. 
So in the red here is the methylated version of the KMER, and in blue is the unmethylated version. And we see that there's quite a large shift upwards of the signal in the methylated version, where the, the distribution is now centered around 63 picoamps, whereas for the uh, unmethylated version, it's about 59 picoamps. This would be relatively easy to call methylation um, off of single reads in this context. Now, um, other sequences are more, more difficult. Here's a different context, ATGGCG. And we see that the, the, the methylated version and the unmethylated version are, are, are quite strongly overlapping. And we probably wouldn't be able to get single base methylation resolution in this context. Uh, but if you pile up a lot of reads and, and sequence to say 30x, we could probably then uh, distinguish between the, the percentage of molecules that are methylated or not in that collection. So having trained this methylation model, uh, we wanted to run it on, on he real human data to see how well it works. So we've sequenced a small amount of the uh, NA12A78 cell line um, and used our, our trained model to predict whether CPG islands that are covered by nanopore read are methylated or not. Um, so in, on the y-axis here is the percentage of, of cytosines in, in CPG islands that are methylated according to our, our nanopore predictive model. And on the x-axis is uh, alumina bisulfite data for the same cell line. And we see that our nanopore measurement is, is largely correlated with the, the, the bisulfite data. And in particular, we pick up uh, the correct biology here in that the CPG islands that are upstream of genes that are lying in promoter regions tend to be uh, unmethylated in, based on both the bisulfite measurement and the nanopore measurement, whereas intergenic CPG islands tend to be methylated. Now, we also performed a negative control experiment here where we uh, PCR treated the human DNA prior to nanopore sequencing, as PCR will get rid of the methylation mark. And if we run our same nanopore predictive model on that data, we predict very low methylation um, for that human data, which in my mind validates that our predictive model is in fact uh, picking up methylation correctly for CPG islands. Um, right, in the, in the few minutes I have left here, I'll just talk about some of the, the problems that I think are, are going to be upcoming for nanopore analysis. Um, so right now, the, the common workflows are um, we'll, we'll sequence the data on the nanopore, we'll then take the events, base call them, use the base called reads to map the nanopore read to somewhere in the reference genome, and then we'll use the signal data to call SNPs from. And this is a lossy procedure because, because the error rate of the nanopore reads is so high, some reads just aren't going to map with a 15% error rate. Um, so what I'd like is to skip the base calling step and take the raw nanopore signal and align the signal to the reference genome and then just do all of the analysis in signal space rather than this intermediate step of uh, base calling. So within my group, we've been investigating using spatial indices like the KD tree, um, which works quite well for small genomes. But the question is whether we can scale this method up to, to human genome sized data sets. So the structure of the KD tree is really just taking uh, the reference genome turning it into a uh, KMERS based on the, the events and what you'd expect the event signal to look like for each position of the reference genome, and then indexing it and doing nearest neighbor searches and clustering them for the whole nanopore read. We have a blog post on my group's blog uh, about this, this process if you want to read more about it. And the thing we're interested in now is seeing whether we can scale. Um, and then really going back to Pavel's question earlier uh, is, is how much we can, information can we extract from the, the time that the signal uh, is in, through the nanopore, in particular to improve things like homopolymer calls. So because we're working on these SIXMER models, um, we don't expect to see a difference in signal if 6As go through the nanopore or 20As go through the nanopore. But what you'd like is the events to be stretched out longer and then use the fact that the, the events would be longer to, uh, to predict how many homopol uh, the length of these homopolymer runs. Um, as I said earlier, the, the duration distribution isn't particularly well behaved because of the stuttering effect of, of the nanopore. Um, but I, there is information there that, that currently nobody's using, and, and, and it's something that a lot of people are, are interested in. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, how can, with current accuracy of nanopores, how can they be applied to cancer? Mm -hmm. the error rates, according to your own 
research hits the wall at 0.5 percent, yeah. which clearly will generate too many erroneous calls for in for human genome or even bacterial. I don't even know how to apply it to bacterial genomes. Sure, I think for cancer, the important thing. So, <coughs> when if, if we take take a if we assemble nanopore data and calculate a consensus sequence for the de novo assembly. We get about 0.3 percent error rate of the, the final sequence. What Pavel is saying is that error rate is too high for, for, for applying it to cancer genomes. But the important thing here is that 0.3 percent remaining errors aren't distributed uniformly through the genome. They're almost all in homopolymer runs. So certainly we can't apply nanopore sequencing to, to, to finding homopolymer length differences in cancer. But I think for the average portion of the genome, even if we have 30x, we can make quite confident SNP calls because those are the those are fairly well behaved regions of the genome. Um, if you're going back to this Ebola work, we we validated our SNP calls across the Ebola genome, and at 30x coverage, we had very few false positives. Most samples zero false positives. Some samples one false positive. So as long as we just focus on the, the, what the nanopore accessible part of the genome is, I think we can get good calls. May I ask you something? Yes. So suppose we focus on nanopore accessible part of the genome where there are no homonucleotide runs. Yeah. But even distinguishing between single nucleotide run and two amino acid, two nucleotide run, AA versus A, mm -hmm. already there is significant error rate. How would you deal with this? I, I don't think I've found that. I think you can, as long as the, the flanking sequence is different, like X, A, A, Y, where X and Y aren't A, I think you can call those without a problem. Um, right, and, and the third thing is, is how well we can make these HMM-based inference algorithms scale. If we sequence a human genome to 30x, we're going to have 100 gigabases of sequence data, but the actual signal data is an order of magnitude more. Um, and, and, and how can we make that scale such that we can make the, the analysis as fast and cheap as the sequencing? So those are the, the three big problems I'm, I'm keeping in mind and things that we're working on in my group. Um, and I'll just end with, with some acknowledgments. I'd like to thank Jonathan Dursi and Matai David in my group um, who work on the algorithms. Phil Zuzardi is a, a, a research technician who's helping us do the sequencing within my group. Uh, and then my collaborators, uh, Nick Lohman and Josh Quick at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Winston Timp and Rachel Workman at Johns Hopkins University, and uh, the members of the, the Pan Cancer Project. All of our codes down here uh, at the bottom if you're interested. Oh. Thank you. Um, so, going back to your plots with respect to Indel and SD codes. Yeah. First of all, you know the question that I'm going to ask sure. how do you figure out the SD codes and how, how confident are you with this? And perhaps as importantly, if you go one slide back, so I, I especially noticed NOAA breaks somewhere uh, close to uh, the bottom with respect to precision. Mm -hmm. If you remember the uh, Dream Challenge, demonstrated NOAA break winning. Over right. how, how, how does it compare to your uh, validation? So as you know, the, the Dream Challenge is simulated data, of course. Yeah. Um, so is there a value in the Dream Challenge? That is the question. Well, uh, this is a controversial question, I think. Um, certainly, we need we, we need to reconcile what's going on. Like something I, I didn't say is this is aggregated across all samples. Um, so if you have one sample where Nova Break made a lot of mutation calls, it's going to have very low precision if they didn't tend tend to be validated. What the Dream Channel, what the Dream Challenge is looking at is single sample performance and. Each group can submit, make multiple submissions there. So there's there's some parameter um, parameter optimization going on in the Dream Challenge that isn't done here. This is looking at 50 samples and, and collective behavior. Um, what I shouldn't show that I, I didn't because I don't have time for is the performance on the 50 different samples. What's the precision per sample per caller? Um, and, and that would probably look different than looking at these aggregated numbers for both indels and, and SVs. So with respect to SVs, how did you call an SV? That, that is, I, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, so we, we called SVs um, using two lines of evidence. So we looked for a consistent pattern of soft clipped reads within the predicted region of the breakpoint. And we also looked for whether um, 
the tumor sample had a, a, a much higher proportion of m discordant read pairs within that region. And if either of those con conditions passed, we said it was a validated call. So it's not the exact breakpoint to actually... We didn't require an exact breakpoint, no. <laughs> Certainly, like, you asked how confident I am in this. There's, there's an entire structural variation working group, as you know, in pan cancer who are also looking at the validation data. This was our first pass at, 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 at getting numbers. Um, there, there is more work to be done, certainly. I didn't understand in your uh, identification of modifications. Was it a totally blind experiment, or was it a control experiment? Like, people now, three years ago, Oxford Nanoporter founder had a paper where they even detected phosphorylation. Mm -hmm. But it was chicken because it wasn't a blind experiment. They know, knew where phosphorylation was to look for. And I was not completely sure whether, like, you showed some result, but was it blind or was it completely blind or you knew where this uh, modifications are? For the human experiment, we didn't know where the modifications were. Going back to this, um, so the, the experiment was like this. We have E. coli DNA, we PCR treat it, and then we methylate it as well. And we sequence both the PCR, which is completely unmethylated, and the synthetically methylated version um, using two parallel nanopore runs. And then we, that's our training data set to distinguish between unmethylated sequence, methylated sequence. We then took human data, native, just a DNA extraction, no PCR, we sequenced it and then predicted methylation, not knowing anything about the methylation patterns in human. Um, and then we also took the same DNA, we PCR treated it, and, and ran our prediction algorithm on the exact same, uh, on, on, that, on the PCR treated. And that's the next slide here. And this is the, the difference between methylated and, and completely unmethylated. So in, in this version, in, in, in the human data set, we, we, we had no prior knowledge of methylation patterns. That wasn't in our, our algorithm at all. We just used the signal data to predict whether it's methylated or not. Just quickly, was the homogenized the DNA or did you purify the DNA out for the human? Um, it, was, it, it, was, it was purified DNA. It was just a normal DNA extraction kit. No histones? No histones, no. So then why would we see this gene effect? Uh, that's just because the, the, the promoters tend to be unmethylated, right? In the chromatinized <coughs> DNA. Sorry? In the chromatinized DNA, before you throw out the histone. So you're saying that, like, if, if we throw out the histones, we're, we wouldn't see the, the, the CPG methylation signal? Um, I'm just saying the, 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 the near, the CPG signal is a chromatinized DNA property. Okay. It's you know, if you purify the DNA and uh, methylate it in vitro. We didn't methylate it in vitro. No, no, this is, this is native DNA. All we did was extract and sequence it. So I'm curious, uh, the nanopore has trouble with, with homopolymer runs, but is it fine with variable length short tandem repeats or you're basically going through yeah. cyclic permutation? As long as it's cycling, it, it, you can pick it up and you could say, you know, if it was AG, 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 you should be able to, to predict the length. Um, do you know any structural variants in that cell line and how were you able to detect any sort of larger structural variants? Uh, from, from the nanopore? Uh, yeah, this is probably the most sequenced human sample. Um, and, and people have spent a lot of time. So this is one of the genome in a bottle samples as well. So there's... Uh, 10x data, which is, is, is 100 KB uh, reads, and, and there's very good collections of structure variations, so that could be used as a resource, but it's not something that we've looked at. Any more questions as we're switching speakers? Now let's thank Jared. Jen tried to make sure we didn't. Get it.